teeth. And they'd always know he was coming because he'd be singing and the children would run out and greet him, apparently. So um, this is very much a, um, a terrain that Blake knew and was, was in, inspired by, um, um, as are we. And we, we see it referenced many, many times in his work. Um, so, you know, we talk about the, the New Jerusalem, the pillars of the New Jerusalem, and it is related to our, our talk tonight, because what is the New Jerusalem? Well, the concept isn't new. Um, it was many references in the Bible, and the prophet Ezekiel had the vision of this, that it's a kingdom, a divine realm, that where all humanity will ultimately meet together in brotherhood and harmony. But it's also a metaphorical homeland, and it's in the Psalms, and it's recorded as a source of joy, God's eternal city, and maybe even the promised land. And Blake's poems, and his work you'll see tonight, conjures up an image of an age where the Lamb of God, Jesus, and his bride, Jerusalem, merge and become one, the ideal for individual person and for society. But to become one, we have to change. We have to let go of some of the old stuff to be able to embrace and then absorb the new. And Blake had the great symbolism of the furnace, of the spiritual furnace that we go into and then we're reshaped into something new and better and shining. And in fact, he mentions Primrose Hill, where we're coming live from tonight, as the, the, the the, the, the mouth of the furnace and, and the iron door. So it's a place where people come to be transformed. And as I say, you always see people um, up there at any time of day. In fact, Blake said that in the area of transformation, that when Albion awakens, the instep of his left foot extends from Windsor to Primrose Hill. So again, that idea of uh, transformation. And how to achieve that transformation? Well, it was through the creator and the champion of man, the spiritual son, because that's who Blake termed as Jesus. The sun planet is Jesus, and the sun is the imagination, it's love. And the spiritual son created the physical sun, which is heat, just physical heat and light, reason and rationality. But the spiritual sun is the greater light which illumines man from within and reveals all the basic and sublime truths. So on this very spot, Blake stood and his vision was to see Jesus through, not with the eye. And to see through the eye is a vision to perceive the divine and the spiritual and everything and every living being and to become one with it. What an experience. And it's not hard to get a sense of that when you're standing on top of Primrose Hill. Um, on Christmas Eve, all the community, we come together, families and kids and prams, all carrying lanterns and, and having candles, singing Christmas carols. And the night is dark and it's a bit fresh in the air, sometimes snow on the ground. But singing these devotional songs to celebrate the birth of Jesus just rings out across the air all across London and beyond and you can't help but feel touched and transcended even and maybe I'll get a little sense of that special place within. So today's um, presentation, um, The Life of Christ by William Blake, as told by William Blake through his images, is researched and compiled by Carol and Louis Garrido a special edition for us um, and it's extended therefore in many ways but not just um, with additional images but um, it's telling more of the life of Jesus physical life but also the story will move into part two next week into his everlasting life and what that means for us today. So um, when Jesus uh, wanted us to feel the, the holy city within us then, then we know that's something that we, as human beings, even today, we probably need more and more. And thank goodness we've got William Blake to guide, guide the way and to give us more insight into these um, very ancient stories and understandings. So um, we'll begin the uh, presentation. So sit back and enjoy, and um, we'll see you at the end. Um, when we finish the presentation, uh, we will have a little reflection time.
because it's quite a lot to take in. And we'll play some music and we'll just sit in silence for a short time. And, um, and then we can share our, our experiences. So let us begin. William Blake's Illustrations to the Life of Jesus Christ God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin. The virgin's name was Mary. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Suddenly the heavenly host appeared saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. The shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. The shepherds left glorifying and praising God. Three Magi came from the east. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They saw the child with his mother Mary and bowed down and worshipped him. They presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus.
the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. It had been revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The parents brought in the child Jesus. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, My eyes have seen your salvation. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. They left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him.
Elizabeth gave birth to a son named John. His father, Zachariah, prophesied, My child, you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months and Mary said, My soul gives glory to God. My spirit is glad in God my Saviour, for he has looked favourably on me, his humble servant. From now on all people will call me blessed. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptised by John. As Jesus was baptised, heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descended like a dove. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, 
but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Mary is troubled by her knowledge of the dangers that lie in Christ's path as he is about to go into the desert. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said to Jesus, If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Standing on the highest point of the temple, the devil said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. 
Jesus answered. It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. After the forty days fasting in the desert, angels came to take care of Christ. Jesus returned to Galilee and went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. A wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother Mary was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, his mother said to him, They have no more wine. Jesus replied, Mother, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Mary said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. They did so, and the water turned into wine. This was the first of Jesus' miracles, and his disciples put their faith in him.
Jesus said, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. After, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he baptized. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it and he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She came up behind Jesus in the crowd and touched his cloak. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. At the house of Jairus, Jesus said, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. He took her by the hand and said, Little girl, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. The good farmer said, let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. But when the harvest comes, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn.
The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the weeds are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. The number of those who ate was about five thousand. Jesus said, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. John the Baptist said, Christ will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish that it was already kindled. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone planted in a field. It is one of the smallest seeds However, when it has grown, it is taller than the herbs. It becomes a tree that is large enough for birds of heaven to nest in its branches. Up in the mountains with Peter, James and John, Jesus was transfigured. His face shone like the sun and his clothes as white as the light. Moses and Elijah appeared. A voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. The disciples heard this. And they fell face down to the ground. Jesus said, A man fell into the hands of robbers. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. By chance, a priest going down the same road, when he saw the man lying there, 
he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place and saw the injured man, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he came where the man was, took pity on him and took care of him. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Jesus said, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return, so that when he comes and knocks, you can immediately open the door for him. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The younger son set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. When he came to his senses, he went back to his father and said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. The foolish ones did not take spare oil and their lamps went out. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour of the coming. They brought in a woman caught in adultery as a trap to have a basis for accusing Jesus. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They kept on questioning him. So he said, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. They all left God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Advocate, who will be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
When the Comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, that one will testify about me. And so here is where we leave part one of the life of Christ. At this point in the story, Jesus is doing really well in his ministry. He's gone out and he's gathered all the seeking souls who want to go further in their spiritual journey. And he's given great testimony to his teachings and performed some what they call miracles and he's gaining a good gathering. In part two we'll see Jesus decides now it's time to enter into the city of Jerusalem and where the story takes quite a different turn. But before we get on to that part of the story which is part two next Friday Let's just have a little bit of time now to absorb all those amazing images and sublime truths, as Blake calls them. And Blake says, there's a moment in the day that Satan cannot find. So why don't we take that moment now and reflect on everything we've seen so far and maybe the insights we've had to our own lives. This last slide, Jesus mentions that one to come after him is the Holy Spirit. And in the Bible, that's where we leave that idea. But Blake, being Blake, interprets in such deeper sense and tells us more that the Holy Spirit can only be, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Mother. We've seen how Mary is constantly with Jesus and supporting him throughout his life and plays a really important role. So in honour of that Divine Mother, the feminine principle that we know is Mother Nature, Mother Earth, it, is, it does exist. Perhaps we can now try and feel a little bit of what Blake is inviting us to. So we're going to just sit back and relax. Just put your hands, palm upwards on your lap, just to let go. And just see if you can feel this cooling power that we've heard in the, the story. And we're now going to play a nice six minute track by Vim LaRoe and John Netheridge. And this music offering is in praise of the Divine Mother and its translation is praise to the Divine Mother who is pure white like jasmine with the coolness of moon the brightness of snow and shines like a garland of pearls who is covered with pure white garments her shining form is incomparable whose eyes are filled with great serenity, who is pure like a crystal, and whose nature is extremely subtle, who is the basis supporting the whole existence, who is full of all perfection, who always radiates the joy of divine bliss, and who is present in all forms.
So that now brings us to the close of part one. In part one of the life of Christ, we've covered the birth and childhood of Jesus Christ, Christ's baptism, the temptations in the desert, and a bit of Christ's public life. In part two, which is next Friday, same time, we see Jesus entering peacefully into the city of Jerusalem, but he's on a mission to strike at the very heart of the wrongdoing, the domination of the government of the Roman Empire and their priests. So, and we'll see how these powerful forces respond to Jesus' peaceful entry to the city of Jerusalem. But before we think ahead to part two next week, where we hope you'll come back and join us, we do have live with us tonight, um, Lewis, Carol and Lewis Garrido. We'll join them in a moment. Um, we've got a couple of questions we'd like to put to them. Um, we can't stay too very late. Um, however, if you have a, have a question you really must ask, you can uh, drop us a note in chat or on the email. Um, but if it's something that, that can wait and you can email us later, even better, because we don't want to spoil your nice, calm, meditative state with too much thinking. William Blake was not keen on the whole rational side of things, but it's, it's good to be informed. So I'll now invite um, Lewis and Carol to join us if they're there, if they'd like to turn their camera on. Hello. Hello. Maybe you can turn your sound on. We can see you, but we'd like to hear you. Unmute. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Well, thank you, first of all, on behalf of everyone who's come to the presentation um, for putting together such an amazing um, presentation. And this is only half of it. Half. Um, yeah, what is to say, it, as it said it all within the presentation, but I know some people have asked me this question, um, and they've wondered that what a fantastic idea, maybe we can put this question to Lewis, what a fantastic idea to show the life story of Christ, but through all the, we didn't know Blake had created so many images depicting the scenes in Christ's life. So fantastic idea. How did you come by it? What inspired you and Carol to work together on creating this amazing topic? Uh, <clears throat> there was uh, several factors. Uh, looking at the paintings of Christ, at one point we realized it looks as if uh, Blake uh, illustrated the whole life of Christ, all the miracles, all the parables, you know, the whole crucifixion, uh, the resurrection, the life of Christ, even the ascension, even the ascension of the Virgin Mary, the, uh, there is also the, you know, then there's the last judgment, and uh, I mean, Blake spent the whole lifetime illustrating the life of Christ. But we we're, were not aware that they had covered so much ground until one day it dawned on us that we have virtually here a, a little film by William Blake, where if you played all the photos in a sequence in a slideshow, uh, yes, that is equivalent to the life of Christ through the paintings of William Blake. So that was an idea. Now we need a narration for a film. And it so happens that the narration is already made by the Gospels, so there's not much for us to do, just uh, <laughs> debate amongst, us, amongst ourselves what would be the best uh, quote of the Bible to illustrate the paintings. So we had uh, a little debate sometimes at home, me and my wife, Carol, who is also a great enthusiast of the Bible, like we both are. And so we argued until we reach some agreement, this could be the best uh, quote of the Bible to illustrate this painting. Oh no, it's too much, you know, too many quotes, too, too much background, there's no need, people know the Bible by heart, but some people don't know it, so that was the agonizing point. How much of the scripture do we quote to illustrate a certain painting? Are we giving too much background or not enough, depending, 
that really depends on the audience, whether they, they are people who have read the Bible well, you know, are very familiar with the subject or not. So we agonized a lot about what quotes to use. In some cases, uh, Blake himself wrote on the margin of the painting. Sometimes it's behind the frame even, you cannot see, but he wrote there uh, which exactly which passage of the Bible he's illustrating. So that made our life very easy in those cases. And uh, strangely enough, sometimes Blake is uh, illustrating life of Christ and then gives uh, writes on the painting, oh, it's after all, it's Exodus, you know, from the Old Testament. <laughs> so very well, Blake knows what he's doing. So the some uh, passages of the Old Testament also came into it, not just from the gospel in the illustrating the paintings of Blake. But the Blake didn't sit down to illustrate the whole life of Christ. That's something he did bit by bit throughout his whole life. There was one a painting of Blake, namely the resurrection. Sorry, uh, I mean the last judgment that uh, we had not included in, the, in this uh, presentation in the past. Uh, but then we, Ultimately, we felt inside, we knew that uh, the scholars tell us that, that Blake spent 17 years working on his vision of the Last Judgment, and he did an incredible painting of Christ sitting in, in his throne. Ah, in let, we we can see that next, next part. Next part. So Let's so not so give so away. <laughs> so, in a sense, you know, this presentation keeps increasing. So, it went from 50 paintings to now almost 90. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time we debated at home between me and Carol, we decided, oh, no, we haven't given enough Bible quotes here. Let's add a few mm -hmm. more uh, more uh, verses of the Bible before and after the quote that we chose mm -hmm. to give more background. So it keeps developing. So talk, but, talking, uh, talking of um, the quotations, um, Carol, I think we'll all agree that um, the narration was so beautifully done and so sensitively that it really matched the, the tone and the, the storytelling that unfolded before our eyes. So um, a, a question that's come in uh, here on our e um, email, which is, uh, you can see, William Blake Fellowship at mail.com. They've asked, um, when you recorded or did the narration, were you more focusing on the storytelling of the quotations as they ran through, or did the images um, uh, have any um, impact for you to do it so beautifully? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think the text and the pictures really do do the job. Um, and um, it just puts you so thoughtless, isn't it? <laughs> Um, the process, um, really for me, having been brought up with the Bible a lot and having read a lot of the Bible and heard it read and um, nearly every day, <laughs> coming from a Protestant missionary family, um, for me it was the paintings which really, really bring the text to life. So. Um, I just felt that this is something really important for people to see that how Blake has portrayed Christ and able to really make us feel something about Christ, which even though we may feel it in our hearts to a certain extent, we really want to be able to feel it more. And I then perhaps we've been able to do in the past. And I just feel really that Blake has brought those totally to life. So when I'm doing the narration, I'm um, trying to follow in the picture where the narration is taking you. So where Blake has put so much detail into the into each of the paintings and each of the each of the details is, is relevant. And if you read wider text around the quotes used, you'll find that even in the um, painting of the um, Simeon being um, uh, in the Christ being presented to Simeon in the temple um, with the Virgin Mary and Joseph bowing down and touching the floor sort of thing and he brought the child. There's a couple of little doves on the other side and those little doves are mentioned in the story but you know we can't fit in everything like Louis said you can't fit in all the detail that everything that Blake puts in the painting is, is 
illustrative of the text and um, it's, it's, it just brings it to life for you and you, you really feel something is awakened in you when you look at Blake. Um, yeah, so I think the process is very much a kind of a loop where you're reading the text, trying to find the right text, like we said, and um, and then I certainly found that if you're reading the text without looking at the paintings, that it doesn't come up, you don't get the same life into your narration. So for me, I found that I'd say to Lewis, no, this this didn't go very well. And let's if when we were rehearsing, it's um, let's try again. I need to look at the painting a bit longer because it's gonna actually help me in doing the in doing the text. So. So Blake is more about sensing and feeling. That's interesting what you're saying. So um, we've just had a, a, a question here, um, uh, just to ask about, please, could you do a presentation of The Last Judgment? Now, we don't want to say too much about it today because we can talk about it next week. Um, but I'm sure that uh, hopefully that's going to be a yes, because when you go into so much more depth into each um, topic, um, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that next week. That would be nice. But another question, Kanim, is um, we saw some images there that had um, oblongs with some text in it. Um, could you explain what those pages were? There were Blake's illustrations, yes. but there was text in the middle. Yes, uh, Blake uh, was illustrating uh, a very long poem by Edward Young. And uh, in uh, about three months, Blake sat down and he, he produced 573, 573 illustrations, no less. We saw quite a few of those during this presentation. How, how, how can Blake? in three months produce 573 illustrations of such high quality. Those watercolors are masterpieces, really. We saw a few throughout this. Who, who can do a thing like this? And of course, uh, so that's why the text is there. Blake has had to put his um, illustration around the, the text, which is a, a very nice poem by uh, Edward Young. In fact, the name of the of the poem is um, Night Thoughts. So there are nine nights in which the, the poet tries to explain the, the principle of the immortality of the soul or the immortality of the spirit. So this must have been a, a subject that is uh, of interest to Blake, although he may not agree with the poem in each and every detail. There are some very important truths in that poem. And, and like use that opportunity to again, as always, do some uh, paintings of Christ. So many many scholars have said that Blake is the last great religious painter, because uh, from a 17th century onwards, there's less religious painters and more mundane painters. So Blake appears in the 18th century, beginning of 19th century. He's probably the last great religious or spiritual painter in the, in the whole world. So we are very lucky that uh, it shows Christ as one of his subjects. So although he didn't sit down to illustrate the whole life of Christ in one sitting, he could easily have done it, you know, if he had been asked to do it, because he did 573 paintings, uh, illustrations, what they call us, for Edward Young. He could as well have uh, illustrated the whole Bible in one go. But he was not commissioned to do so. He was commissioned to do one painting a week, a religious painting a week for a few years by Thomas Butts, a very great patron of William Blake. So for a few years, Blake was producing one religious painting a week for Thomas Butts. And the other people then liked them so much, they demanded, we, we want the same, you know. So the, the, the painter Linnell came and asked, can I have the whole uh, illustrations to the book of Job as well. I want my own copy in my in my sitting room, like Thomas Budd says. So Blake had to do another another copy. Then there was another copy. A third copy was done also that now is in New Zealand. Mm. So Blake could have done the whole life of Christ and more if only he had been commissioned to do so. He was commissioned to do the book of Job several times, so he did it. That's the Old Testament. But uh, for the Gospels, had they commissioned him to do, he would have done the whole lot in three months, probably. 
you can do it. <laughs> so, so just on the part one that we've been today, I just wonder um, if Carol could comment that this is the first time we see more of Mary, the mother. And I just wonder if when you were observing and absorbing the images when you were narrating, did, were you, did you become aware of that? that here, we're, almost in every other slide, we're seeing um, Mary appear. And is Definitely. That yeah. Sorry. Is that something you think I mean, was aware of, or obviously? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, she's always there, nearly always there, isn't she, in the paintings? I mean, the, perhaps the one where you can't quite see her is the one in uh, the wedding at Cana, but that was one of the Edward Knight, young Knight Swords paintings um, with the grey bit in the middle. Um, but she's that's where she's very much mentioned in the gospel because in fact, the gospel doesn't mention her that much. So we've, but Blake definitely did all the painting of her, all the places in which she is mentioned and more, you know, so he always puts her in the, um, sometimes obviously she's mentioned as the parents of, of, of Jesus. And so she's there in those, once, but um, the, the places where she's actually saying something or um, where Christ's speaking to her personally, then he, he, I think he is very, very aware of her mm -hmm. important, very important part, yeah. And just fo following on that theme, um, William Blake would say, of course, we talk about he is the, the originator of these great works, but let's not forget Catherine Blake, because like your two good selves working as a partnership, um, I, maybe you, I don't know if you got a sense of her there, but I mean, from what you know, you're you're very great Blakeians um, that you know about Catherine, and they they work together. She printed with him, and she they they're very much um, in the printing process together and colouring. And people may not know uh, yes, that uh, on that subject of the colourings, there is a, a version of Edward Young's illustrations by, by Blake, which is colored by Catherine Blake. So that's 573 colorings by Catherine Blake. And she actually signed and put her initials, of, you know, see Catherine Blake, you know, on the on the book. So we know it's uh, actually a work. She was the one who did all the coloring of those. No, actually, it's not 573. It's actually just 42, because uh, what Catherine uh, colored was the engravings because uh, out of those 573 uh, uh, watercolors that Blake made, only 43 were engraved and published and sold. And Catherine actually colored one whole, one whole book was colored by Catherine Blake. And that the book was whole, completely, you know, from beginning to end colored, colored also by William Blake. All the other known copies are colored by professional colorists. So Catherine Blake ranks it is actually a better colorist than the professional colorists. In fact, some of the versions that uh, we can find, uh, the scholars say about them, the coloring is grotesque. You know, the coloring is not so good. It does not uh, express the feelings of the characters in the painting, but uh, not the case when it's colored by Blake or when it's colored by Kathleen Blake. So she was, she understood everything. She knew everything. In fact, uh, everybody says Blake could not have done what he did without her. Really, she was fundamental. Mm. Definitely. So we've just got a comment. You mentioned the Book of Job um, and someone who suggested it would be wonderful to have a presentation in the same way we've done tonight. And um, stop press, I think, because we do actually have that coming up. Um, Lewis and Carol have been working on a, a similar presentation tonight on the book of, of Job. So, so someone's uh, wish is granted already <laughs> through the, the living power of William Blake. How wonderful, his, his pure desire. So that will be coming up. And maybe Lewis and Carol can tell us a little bit more about that next week. And just talking of um, uh, uh, William and Catherine, um, we do have a presentation coming up that's celebrating their wedding anniversary next month. So we can tell you more about that next week. But meanwhile, I think we can round the evening off now. And thank you to Lewis and Carol for sharing this amazing <laughs> uh, talk tonight. 
and um, uh, obviously, hopefully, you'll come back. Well, we'll have the, the presentation next week, and hopefully, you maybe will stay around and ask answer a couple more questions next week because people can maybe didn't think of something this week might think of something for next week. For example, someone's just come in and said, "What? Why was Jesus' portrait with blue eyes? This beautiful image of blue eyes." I don't know. Maybe yes. oh, we do have an answer. <laughs> It is true. If you look carefully, yes, there are a few with blue eyes, but there are some with brown eyes. There's even that one, um, which where the Virgin is crying. You know, you can see the tears in her eyes. And if you look carefully, the Virgin has braided African hair, and so does uh, the little baby Jesus. So the whenever Blake paints uh, Christ, the idea is to stimulate our imagination into some emotional response some divine feeling about it now for certain audiences it might be yes we are going to use blue eyes but for other audiences we are going to use brown eyes african hair braided hair for the virgin you know little little um, very curly african hair for christ himself in that painting we saw of the virgin crying so it's not always uh, the blue eyes it, it varies you know so blake uh, can address the whole uh, it's, it's very universal i see blake is able to communicate this love for christ for for the whole world really well our questioner has said that's a fantastic answer and is very happy with that answer so worth worth <laughs> worth posing. So I think we can wrap up now. And um, as I say, any questions you have during the week, or if it hopefully today has awakened you a little bit more to William Blake and how really relevant he still is in our lives today. And that's the purpose of the fellowship is to see that Blake isn't just somebody from 200 years ago, as Lewis and Carol have said that he, he speaks to us um, today. So thank you, Lewis and Carol, um, from our hearts. It's really wonderful to have this Blake experience because it is an experience. Thank you for wanting to bring this to us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so we look forward to next week and uh, Lewis and Carol will be back to do part two. Again, not just, just as you think you know the Bible, just as you think you know the story of Jesus, when you see it, from Blake's um, interpretation, wow, it can take you to another level of understanding. And subtlety was the word used a couple of times tonight. So um, in for maybe some surprises next week. So we'll look forward to that. So we'll come back here um, same time next week. A link will be sent out to the, uh, the mailing list. And if you want to be on the mailing list, there you go. There's the details. Um, so do get your, your name down there to be sure that you get the links uh, for next week. I'd just like to thank Nick Duncan for creating the, uh, the facility for us all to come together in one place tonight through the mailing list and the work that he's doing with the technical. And a huge thanks that we wouldn't be on air tonight if it wasn't for Carlos Dominguez, who has been so patient and sharing his expertise so that we can enjoy Blake together. So thank you so much, Carlos. We wouldn't be here literally um, without you. And thank you to all those and to Vimala, Ro and John Esseries. I hope you enjoyed that music. And we'll again in the mailing list, we'll send you the links and the album that you can enjoy that again yourself. But do give us feedback. Vim Leroux and John Etheridge will be joining us again uh, next week with, it, with another beautiful piece relevant to that part of Jesus' story. So we look forward to having them back as our musical guests. Um, so I think we will just um, uh, finish our uh, part one and wait forward to look forward to seeing what Blake delivers for us next week, of course, through, through Lewis and Carol. So people are just sending in some chats at the moment and they're saying this is wonderful presentation and talk. 
just amazing. They're having lovely experiences through the, the evening. A beautiful evening with William Blake, thanks to all the organisers. So, well, that's all we do it for. Um, it's, it's really not an effort. It's, it's a joy. Um, so we will say goodbye for now and we will see you next week. But do join us on the mailing list and we can send you some information about Vim Moreau and John Essowage and you can jo join more of their work. Um, so I would say goodbye again, Lewis and Carol, and we, we will you. we will see you next week. Thank you very much. Right. That would be lovely. Oh, okay. I think we've just got one more chat coming in. No. Okay. So see you soon, and see you see everyone next week. Bye for now. Bye bye. bye.